Hello, everyone, and thank you very much for coming. My name is Toma Ewan, and I'm a Canadian tapestry artist, and I've been weaving tapestries for almost 40 years. Um, this is a picture of the Gatineau Hills just outside the studio of Moon Rain Centre. I'm artistic director of Moon Rain Centre, which is a tapestry and textile arts centre located in the Gatineau Hills in West Quebec. It's just one hour driving distance north of Ottawa. Here's another image. The region is called the Utawe, which is the native Algonquin name for the lands bordering the Ottawa River, which is the western boundary of the province of Quebec. And here's an image of the studio at Moon Rain Centre in the background. Moon Rain Centre is dedicated to interweaving textile art and community. The name Moon Rain represents the mystic connection between the moving, the moon, weaving, and the cosmos. The moon is Ishel, the divine weaver to the Maya. The name Moon Rain came one night while I was watching a shower of meteorites over a full moon in mid-August during one of my first summers of weaving in the Gatineau Hills. This shower of meteorites comes every August and is called the Perseids. This is um, my Fibra Boreal group inside the studio of Moon Rain Center. Uh, Phyllis Wedding is here. Uh, and we had a, an exhibition at the Wakefield Library uh, with the Trina. And here is uh, another image inside the studio uh, working with the same group, uh, Fibra Boreal. We were um, um, looking at work, putting work together on the floor of the studio, preparing for an exhibition. I studied tapestry weaving in Finland at the Graduate Institute of Fine Arts in uh, Ateneum, Helsinki, in a master's level program, and apprenticed with Finnish tapestry artist Oili Mäki. I had my first tapestry exhibition in Toronto in 1975 at the University of Toronto. Since that time, I've been weaving tapestries, organizing tapestry exhibitions, and teaching tapestry techniques and the art history of tapestry, and building and directing Moon Rain Center and its programs and projects. Throughout this time, I've been profoundly moved by the beauty and mystery of weave, and have grown to understand why weaving is considered a sacred path in many cultures. Weaving has been my teacher and my guide, and has begun to reveal to me some of the mysteries that I call the secrets of weaving. Cherishing these mysteries, this knowledge, has nourished my practice and deepened my great love and respect for tapestry weaving, and explains why I continue to weave. This tapestry is Metamorphosis. It's actually one of this series of light refraction tapestries, also five feet by seven feet which is uh, an intuitive exploration of light and energy flow patterns. Here's an exhibition from um, uh, Lyon, France, from the Bibliothèque de Lyon, uh, an exhibition in 2008 where I exhibited 12 large tapestries. On the right is the tapestry offering at Spider Rock, and this tapestry represents an experience I had in Canyon de Che in Arizona. Spider rock, it, it's actually the, the rock formation at the left of the tapestry, the, the brown that seems to go vertically up, and that is spider rock. It's considered to be the most sacred site of the Navajo Amerindian people, and the rock is thought to be an antenna or transmitter to the ancestors. Spider Woman is the Navajo creator spirit, and legend tells that Spider Woman spun the universe, stretched out a warp on the four directions, and wove the earth into being. She created first man and first woman, and gave them the earth as their home. She was so happy with all of her creations that she fashioned a small loom and gave the gift of weaving to first woman. It is very interesting that similar creation myths 
that have weaving as the creative principle exist in many cultures over the world. Maya, Egyptian, Hindu, Peruvian, Shinto Japanese, and Chinese. To name a few. And this tapestry is called Ribbons of Light. Light is an important element and personal source of inspiration. And I try to communicate a feeling of harmony and movement through my work. The Buddhist concept of radiance from a central point is one of my theme songs and a concept that I've spent years visually exploring. When we think about how weaving has accompanied human cultures as cloth and clothing since before recorded time and throughout recorded time, we can begin to realize what a constant, continuous partner weaving is to culture. Weaving is universal. The same basic technique used for tapestry that I've used here in all my pieces, called plain weave or tabby, is the basis for all weaving everywhere. Weaving is a universal connector of human cultures, an intercultural and intergenerational connector. Art historians generally attribute weaving to the ancient Egyptians at 3500 BC, or to ancient Peruvians at 10,000 BC. Yet spun, dyed, and woven fragments of textiles have been recently discovered in caves in Russia that carbon date from 24,000 BC to 34,000 BC. So we are just beginning to rediscover and reconstruct a more accurate history of textiles. Here's another tapestry called Aurora Borealis Behind the Trees, number four, Curtain of Light. And this tapestry is in uh, one of the Triennale exhibitions at Gather Montcalm called the New Art of the Loom International Contemporary Tapestry Six. Touring through North American art museums, and I brought it to Gatineau for the Triennale, and I've arranged for it to go to Montreal next to a museum in Montreal. Moonring Center was established in 1991 dedicated to integrating creativity and harmony in the community through the creation, exhibition, and teaching of tapestry weaving and textile arts. There are two basic concepts that nourish and propel my work at Moon Rain Center. One is that weaving is a universal cultural connector, and the other is that weaving transmits the energy of peace. Moon Rain Center has been developing and establishing these concepts through Artists in the Schools projects and through textile arts projects done with public community participation. We find that these projects are putting the word weaving back into the vocabulary. Here's an image of an artist in the school project. In working in schools with classrooms of sometimes 30 children, it becomes very readily visible that weaving is an equalizer and that weaving creates harmony and peace. It is a Navajo belief that weaving transmits the energy of peace. And this is completely evident while working with children. School principals, teachers, and parents are amazed at the effect that weaving has on a class full of hyperactive children. They become normal. This is because weaving balances left and right brain functioning. In weaving, every movement is followed by its opposite. You go from left to right, right to left, under, over, under, over, back and forth, in and out. This constant repetition of every movement followed by its opposite while using both left and right hands equally, uses both left and right sides of the brain equally. And this actually physically creates harmony, balance, and calm. The, Navajo, the Navajos call this state of balance beauty. This is a project done in, uh, in British Columbia. It was done at a community college. Um, in collaboration with two, 
Two Rivers Gallery, which is the Art Museum of Northern British Columbia and the British Columbia Arts Council. <coughs> the Navajos call this state of balance beauty, and their weavers chant the song or mantra that weavers have sung through millennia while weaving translates, with me there is beauty, in me there is beauty, from me radiates beauty. This is a project done in Canton, a community project. When I tell this chant to a classroom of children in an artisan schools project, they remember it. When I tell children that weaving puts more peace back into the world, they immediately want to become weavers. Children want to weave, they want to be weaving activists, they want to do anything that can possibly help the world. This is Tisan Valde Mong, Tucson Songbo Community Project. Over the last 12 years, Moon Ray Center has been directing profoundly moving and publicly engaging woven public art projects in which the public participates to co-create its own publicly commissioned, permanently installed work of art. These community textile arts projects have been very highly praised and illustrate the two basic principles I mentioned, that weaving is a cultural connector and that weaving transmits the energy of peace. Moon Rain Center has become interna internationally known for directing community public art projects. And this is the project that we did in, in France, in Lyon, for the Bibliothèque de Lyon. And it was the first time I did uh, the Vision Weave project. So after almost 40 years of weaving tapestries, I've become very aware of the fact that weaving is special, and I understand why it is a sacred path. Today, weaving has a very contemporary role to play. It is a symbol for interconnections. Weaving is a global contemporary metaphor for the interconnections, interrelationships, and interdependencies that naturally occur in all living systems of our biosphere. Weaving gives us a readily understandable image for living, healthy community, for cooperation and collaboration. So I wanted to do more. I wanted to actively use weaving as a contemporary tool for peace. And so I conceived the Vision Weave project. And I had my first opportunity to do the project in France, actually, for the Bibliothèque de Lyon in 2008. And so here are children weaving in, uh, in the Lyon library in the midst of an exhibition I had. I conceived the Vision Weave project in 2007 because I was asking myself what do people really want for the earth and for humanity and for communities. The media portrays violence, terrorism, and war. In Vision Weave, people write their message or their vision for the earth or for the future of life on the planet onto a piece of ribbon and then interweave the ribbon into a collective tapestry. And this was a little vision wave project that we were asked to do for the Museum of Civilization for Earth Day. Earth Day, We have a Vision for the Earth was a project in 2009. And the little boy on the left wrote his, his message, the vision was, Arrete la pollution, stop the pollution. And the little girl on the right, completely um, unrelated, wrote, stop polluting. I thought this was really quite wonderful. I've been amazed at how people want to participate in the project. I'm amazed at their enthusiasm, spontaneity, their desire to give, to contribute, and to openly express and share their innermost hopes and visions for the earth. So here's also uh, another uh, picture from the Museum of Civilization. People need to know that they can do something, anything, to contribute in a positive way to make the world a better place. And people need to know that we are all thinking the same things, that we all basically want the same things in our own lives and collectively as a society. We all want peace. 
So most of the messages in the Vision Wave projects, whether we've done the project in North America or Europe, whether it's done in a community center, a library, an art gallery, a school, a shopping mall, outdoors in a public park, or in a street festival, most of the messages say, peace on earth. Okay. I, found that, I found that very interesting because I started the project because I wanted to know what people want. And this told me. And we, we um, make a record of all the messages. So I needed this tangible proof of these recorded messages that this is what people want for the earth, for humanity, and for our community. And this is a, um, a Vision Week project that we did for the city of Ottawa as a public art project uh, for the Albion Hetherington Recreation Centre. So on the left, the, this group of children, they're all weaving messages on ribbons and writing their message into the book. And, and then they are weaving their messages in Onto the, into the tapestry. And here is the finished project, uh, project installed in the Albion Hetherington Community Centre. We did, uh, we've done this project, sorry, sometimes as a circle. So this was a vision circle project done for Onslow Elementary School, just down the road here in the Pontiac. And um, one, one boy is weaving on the tapestry, and, and there is a little girl weaving, uh, sorry, reading the messages out of the book. So usually as part of the proje project, all of the messages are read out loud to the, to the children in the school. And here's a family that all came together to work on the project. So that was very nice, often in a school parents and grandparents are invited. Sometimes the parents come and assist, and sometimes they just come to, to write in their messages when you can order it. And here's part of the finished project. And here is um, a detail of the ribbons, and you can see sort of little bits of writing on, on the ends of some of the ribbons. And so this project has shown me that Everywhere, people on the earth envision peace, and um, and I'm, I'm, I think that's great. My belief is that if we all think together and share our thoughts and goals, we can create together. And the first step is to envision a goal. The Vision Wave project has provided a vehicle for <coughs> solidarity, co-creation, for community building provisioning and goal setting, and it is weaving activism. The finished woven tapestries become public art. It is public art that's made for and by its own community. <coughs> In the summer of 2010, Moon Rain Center organized When 13 Moons Entwine an international textile arts event that linked international professional artists with regional emerging textile artists in the creation of outdoor textile arts exhibits along a, a 1.5 kilometer walking path at Moon Rain Center. And uh, this, is, this has been our, our biggest project so far to date. Um, the, my biggest collaborator, really the initiator of the project is is Gabby Ewan here, another textile artist, wonderful textile artist, and my daughter. And uh, we first, actually in 2007, had an open studio, and it was so successful that um, we decided to try to make it into a recurring event. <coughs> and through this uh, has evolved the International Textile Arts Triennial. And so I will just show you some of the images, both from 2010 and, um, and 2013, where this exhibition here at Portage du Four is um, one of the last exhibits um, as part of the Triennale. The very last one is Dale Schuck's exhibit at Gallery Art Brunel. So, I hope 
if you have a chance to see that as well. Uh, this is a piece by Christina Savage and a detail. Um, Michelle Suarez and Mary Pierre St. Georges and a detail. Natalie Lavasseur. Eva Bartos Mazas from Poland and a detail of her work. Yolanta Spraka from Quebec. So all of these, all of these were um, integrated into the into the natural environment. Andy Holtrick. And all using textile techniques. Irene Anton from Germany, Nadine Dupeu from France, Gail Moran from France, Johanna Nussi Island from Quebec and Finland, and um, Jeanne Vaillancourt and Hannah Ranger. And some details of their work. And um, this Triennale in 2010, we also collaborated with exhibition centers in the region, and this is from the Fibre Boreal exhibit at Espace Pierre to Bain in, in 2010. And we also organized um, text, textile arts uh, workshops, and this is a workshop given by Ali Rab Jones from England, who um, is, is leaning down, but everyone made a felted scarf and they are hanging on the line drying behind her. So there have been a marvelous series of workshops where textile arts are, are taught. And um, interestingly enough, there, there have been people who've begun their textile arts careers through these workshops, which um, is just is really marvelous. Here's a piece by Ali Rab Jones, one of her guardians of, of uh, site one of this year. Marina Batech from Argentina and Maureen Bala from Orleans. Here's uh, a piece by Diane Lemire. Um, they wrapped wire, barbed wire, like a barbed wire fence. and embroidery by a young Quebec artist named Luanne Bordeaux. One of Gabby's installations, beaded and embroidered. Once again, Irene Anton from Germany, who worked with a young Quebec artist named Caroline Gagnette. This was one of my pieces hanging, also using natural fibers. Lisa Dufresne from Guelph. And Lynn Bedrock from Wakefield. And a detail of her work. And that's, that's the end of the presentation. Are there any questions? What happened to the horse after? He was taken at home. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question. All of those pieces up in the, uh, out in the open, how long were they out there? Because they're subject to a nature, right? Yes. Um, they were out, there was a two week creation period where the artists were in residence uh, beginning their work, so it was up to about six weeks. So there was, the Triennale was open to the public for four weeks, for a month. So, so six weeks. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing how textile arts are actually very resilient. And, um, I used sisal for a piece in a textile art exhibit a number of years ago, and um, 
The piece was out for most of the summer on site as part of the exhibition that I brought it home and hung it in a tree. And it hung for about five years in the yard. Um, actually, it was not the weather that destroyed it, it was cows. <laughs> rubbing, cows decided to rub up against it and they liked it. And, they liked it. and I eventually took it down because it started to look like a So I, I think it's, um, I think textile arts are actually much more resilient and have much more longevity than um, than the per perception, than the prejudice, than our, you know, our paternalistic society has deemed textile arts delicate. And really and truly, um, conservators and museum curators all over the world are agreeing that these are these are not the most fragile media any anymore that you know stone the metal that is left outside is uh, is subject with acid rain is subject to actually more um, or really can't take it um, most most natural fibers have have uh, natural oils or sort of protective elements in them that can withstand much more than we give them credit to yeah I think we've we've all also um, um, acrylic fibers don't seem to last as well as uh, natural fibers, but we've been indoctrinated to to think that uh, you know they have things get used up and have to be thrown away. Very fast. Just go to the museum and look at the, the most ancient clothing, some of which is like made out of silk or made out of um, uh, jute or whatever natural fibers. They they do last. And you know, I think this is one of the things with the the triennale. We've uh, we've tried to promote textile art as um, equal to all the other arts, and um, and I think the with the the triennale has allowed us to succeed there. And we you know we we need to sort of promote these concepts and and um, let the world know that um, it's as it's as strong. It's it's good. It's out there. <laughs> One of the pieces that we did see from Jean Bayancourt and Fleda Ranger in the dome mm -hmm. that had the, the textile sort of woven into it and the belting as well was applied to some pieces of the material and I think two fibers that were woven on it. That one actually stayed up for three years and got taken down this past spring. And everything everything was great. It was the wood had shrunk and so where the branches had been lashed together had loosened. The dome part did not survive. The textile art sort of embellishments all survived. The another installation was just taken down this spring too. It was Carol Bayergian, who is director of the Ecole des Métiers d'Art of Quebec, and she did an installation with like shirt collars and bout boutonniers, the fronts of shirts of men, and and um, uh, handkerchiefs sort of right beside in another tree. And so there were dozens of these shirt collars, and literally there was like almost no change, maybe a little bit of graying, like a touch of maybe mildewing or something on them. But the fabric was fine, and most of the most of the shirts were cotton, and they held up. It was the acrylic handkerchiefs that that disintegrated. Yeah, but some of the lace handkerchiefs that were cotton lace were fine. I mean, it was really, you know, and I wished that I had had the time to document that and mm -hmm. do it, but I, I didn't. <laughs> yeah. Very interesting. Are you going to do the Triennale again? Well, we are discussing it. Yes, we're hoping to. Yes, yes. A number of people have come forward to say they're interested in working on an organizing committee, and, and so that's really what we need. We need a good, solid committee. Yeah. Because it seemed like from the first time, the second time, there were a huge um, increase in visibility, publicity, yes. type of work. Yes, yes, we really worked hard. We learned great deal from the first one. And, um, and I think this, 
second one, you know, it's interesting. I was thinking it was the name Matrice, which in, in French is like womb. And it was almost like, um, it was like the first event was sort of an experimentation. But with the second event, it was almost like a, like a birthing and an and, and acceptation of, of the arts community and getting behind people just coming forward and saying, yes, we have to work together and yes, we will join the, the, the board and, and get it going. And so I thought that was incredibly positive. So, good. <laughs> I was just wondering how many people have actually went out to, to see any of these in nature? I've been to the one in nature, but I've been to one, there, uh, a number of the exhibits, actually yeah. most of them. Yeah. Well, I, I really encourage you to, to visit the site yeah. because the, the art takes on the spirit of the land. Yeah. yeah. And uh, you can see the one with the, uh, uh, the white fabric into the, the stream mm -hmm. there. And it's, 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 all land, yeah. it's done now. Yeah. Some of them are still up. I'm not sure exactly how many are still up. Some of them are still up because the artists haven't moved it back yet, or I, I haven't had the time to go and take down the pieces. Um, so some of them are still up, but it, it ended on September 29th. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I, I would like to say thank you to Dale Shutt for organizing the wonderful series of exhibits here, mm. this beautiful gallery, and we're very happy yeah. to exhibit here. Thank you for accepting to be part of the tree now. We have a little gift for, for Dale and for Leanna, who has videoed mm. all of the events of the tree now. She's documented them. Wow. So we have a little gift. Sorry, it's our last one of the season, but uh, the gallery will open again next spring. And just wonderful show, and the whole Triennale. That was that's an amazing piece of work that you have done organizing that. And as a fiber artist, thank you. <laughs> and I'll see you next week. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you all for, for coming. Mm -hmm. Yes. Just on uh, the issue of uh, natural fibers, uh, from my experience, the work I've done, uh, not, not to read them, uh, is the sun. The sun is the enemy. Uh, in, uh, like, I work in the fishing industry, and, and so all of those nylon cables and so on deteriorate over a period of one to two, three years because of the, the UV rays on the sun. And I think natural fibers are stronger. Yeah, actually. they would be strong. They're much more expensive, I think, as well. Yes, I, I think traditionally, um, like in, in fishing, it's, it's jute or hemp right. fibers that people, or linen, flax, that people have traditionally used. Right. Um, and, you know, I wouldn't say the sun is, I wouldn't say the sun is not to natural fibers, but you would not want to put a work of art in direct sun, any work of art, actually, because, because the color of the It's going to fade. But um, I, I think that's much more pronounced with acrylics, acrylic fibers, yeah, because, and deterioration. Because they have to take the tensile strength, and, and over a period of months or a year, it, uh, it just it, it gets weaker and weaker. Yes. And uh, the regulations require uh, a certain tensile strength, and if it isn't there, they have to replace it. Uh, but I, I think um, traditionally the natural fibers right. have held up much longer, and and you know, like the medieval tapestries are 500, 600 years right. old, mm -hmm. and hopefully mine will last for several years. Yes. <laughs> There's no reason why not. Right. Really, truly, you know, yeah. And you know, we've all had wool jackets, and they last for years and years and years. Acrylic wool. No, yeah, right here. No, and it yeah, can't really yeah. be cleaned either. Um, it's because wool, um, dirt doesn't enter the fiber. It, there's, there's a protective coating of oil, and wool, uh, dirt or any grime will stay on the surface and can be removed. Whereas a 
acrylic the any grime enters the fiber right. and can't be removed. If you're cleaning it then you have to use steam and vacuum, is that the way you would do it? Or? I I actually only had to wash um, a couple of tapestries. One tapestry was in a private collection in a building in downtown Toronto that overlooked the Gardiner Expressway. And it was a building that, um, an old office building, all the windows open. So grime came in and there was like a layer of grime at the top. And I washed it and it was fine. So do you lose the oils when you wash or? or? Now, um, you have to use a very, uh, you have to use natural soap uh -huh. that once again has its own oil in it or right. the, the fats in it. Um, and you would do it very gently. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. But I've never, I've, I've never had soda problems. But yeah. Yeah, and, and traditionally, you know, people um, are often asked the question, well, how do you maintain it? Well, if the environment is relatively clean, you don't have a problem. You know, it's only if there are smokers or, um, you know, or some sort of like, like that situation in Toronto where there was real grime and pollution coming in. Um, so, so really, I've had tap I have tapestries that are, you know, some of my first tapestries. And I once took a tapestry and took the lining off and I thought that there would be a great difference between the front and the back. And there was no difference at all. I was quite surprised. Yeah. I thought it would have faded or, you know, look. You know, dirty. You know, it was really a nice. I think that's the the value and the attributes of yarn of pure wool. Yeah. And when you think, you know, these medieval tapestries have been sort of up in built in spaces really for hundreds of years, mm -hmm. and there's this wonderful resilience of natural fibers. You know, that it's alive. <laughs> I think you know, you're working with something. It's my sense, maybe, uh, for others, I, I just met you last week, right? But, and I bought a small loom. But you can make as big a loom as you want. I mean, you can make, you don't have to go over to like a, like a, you know, like a Leclerc loom or, some loom or something like that. You don't have to go buy one that's ready made. You can that's actually right. make whatever size you want. That's right, that's right. And, and the simple model of loom is, is just mm -hmm. the most basic little model. And my big looms are, are just basic uh, frames, really, and I have, you know, feet on some of them, and I can, I can move them or change. So did you them. make them? Yes, myself or my ex-husband, yeah. uh, carpenters. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm really like you went to a store and bought a loom. No, I've never, um, never gone to a store and bought a loom. I have, <laughs> but it was a, it was a counterbalance. Well, you oh, know, yeah, um, yeah, a loom is a device for holding threads in tension. Right. Okay? It's simply there to hold the threads in tension. So whatever whatever will do that, you can use a, a picture frame and put nails in top of it. Or even just wind just, yeah. uh, a warp around, you know, a piece of cardboard, a box, a frame, anything. So, so if you're doing a finer piece of work, would you yeah. put the nails closer? That's right. We had a discussion about that at lunch. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's right. It's, it's really very simple, and, and the technique that I have sort of evolved and that I teach is that it's got to be simple. You know, this, why torture ourselves? You know, it's simple, it works, it's nice to do, and it's basically common sense. So, yes. I even use the small pieces, like a frame and duct tape to hold it, no nails. <laughs> oh, really? So you can oh, be creative. I thought, they, I thought we used duct tape to keep airplanes I together. Use, I, I, know, know, I, love, I love duct tape. Duct tape is good for everything. <laughs> <laughs> so It's a white thing? No, it's a gray one. It's a gray one. <laughs> it's it comes in white now. Oh, does it? Yeah. Okay, so, anyways, I didn't mind that. But, you know, How do you get the spacing in When you, you just put your line with the pencil, and then you put your, you work it, and then you just to stabilize it, I use the duct tape. <laughs> So you would use individual threads for each? No, I would do like a yeah, yeah. It's a it continuous, continuous it's called a continuous work. So we do it, like the, the loom you bought for me, it goes up and down over the nails. Yeah. But you She's can also, 
wrap it around. So you could have a frame without nails and wrap it around and you would want to maybe mark the inches or centimeters mm -hmm. on there. So, yeah. I don't have the pointer ring. I thought it was still working. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's a good one here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So these were all done on, on very simple frame looms, just you know a larger version of the wire loom. Mm -hmm. So now I know I thought of another thing. So if you use a duct tape and wrap around, and your warp breaks, let's say, how do you how do you repair you, that? You just you just reattach it. You you tie yeah. another piece in, so you tie a knot here and tie a knot there. Okay. okay. Yeah. And you can weave over that. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm actually not a, um, um, a carpenter either. I'm not, really not very handy. <laughs> top and bottom. They're, they're very nicely made by a local carpenter. And, and we, sell the, we sell the weaving manual that I've written in a little, in a little bag. And they can order this on your website? Yes, they can order it on the website, yes. Yeah, yeah it's our loom kit. And he bought one. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> yeah, so the one I'm doing, I didn't, uh, I, I started at the beginning nail, like I found out where the center was, but I started at the beginning nail and worked over, and then one nail left over on the bottom. That's uh, yes, that's okay. That's yeah. 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 But I don't have the guides. You can, you can just tie guy threads on on each side. Yes. <laughs> just actually nails at the top, nails above it. If you want those duct tape, you can. the guys work. They do, they yeah. really help. Actually, it's an amazing trick, the guide. The guide oh, threads, yes. Yeah. 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 And you, for the, for the design, yeah. do you trace on the warp? On the warp. I do. I will put lines on the warp. With what? With a marker. With a, a marker? Yes. A, a marker. marker. On, um, a non-washable marker. No, no, it doesn't. You have to make sure that it's uh, permanent. Yeah. Which one of the workshops do you have to offer at Monterey with Archie Brennan and Susan McPhee? They built a little tapestry room with copper, yes. copper pipe. Copper. And basically, they do continuous warping, and, and then you can actually do, you can actually move your work yes. around. It's on their website, so they have, they've been building their, these looms forever, yeah. I think. Yeah. And they make them, some are huge. Oh, yeah. These that, there. That's what they use. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so it's, yeah. so loom, I think tapestry loom is so versatile, it's mm -hmm. compared yes. to other. Well, well, when you, when you consider that, you know, this tapestry technique is, um, is very simple, it's the simplest of weaving techniques, and when you consider that a loom is a device for holding threads in tension. Well, anything could be a loom, and when you think about all the different cultures around the world that weave with different kinds of looms, backstrap looms, and floor looms, upright looms, you know, and it's all basically the same technique, um, no matter what kind of loom. So this is, this is really very interesting, you know, yeah. Participated in the Trianal and has taught workshops. And this past event, Trianal, she did a community project action for an art center. And she will do these community projects, she calls them street weaving. And she'll use, like, you know, like the doll, like, um, well, like a coat, a coat rack, or any, like, a chair. So she'll wrap around the chair 
and then weave on that, oh. or on a coat stitch, like a coat rack coat stitch. She'll just wrap around it or around it, and then use that to weave on to as this way of like any any way that you can hold your dress tight, tight. Mm -hmm. or a piece of you know styrofoam that like vegetables or meat comes on mm -hmm. that like round around 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 round. There you go. You've got your loop done. Yeah, you've got you know it. so. So it, it's really amazing how people have been really ingenious about making it so accessible that, you yeah. know. So if I was to go to the knitting shop and they have skeins of wool, that would yeah. be the right thickness to apply, yes. generally? Yes, yes. Because that's the, that's the next thing is where to find, and the cotton as well, for the warp. Where do you get that? Um, I order it. I can I can give you the the name of the place that I order it from. Actually, we've been talking about maybe that um, Wabi Sabi would, because this is the owner of Wabi Sabi in yeah. Ottawa, a oh. yarn store. So we've been talking maybe that she yeah, would bring it in. I'm looking into that because I I it's from Sweden, but I have to yeah. order it from the states. So this is a good. Because I saw it on the net, but you didn't have an address. Am I right? Wabi Sabi. Is there an address for it? And we don't have warp trip, but I, I want to carry some because I've been even for myself, you know. So you have all the other, you only get the wool? Oh, we have tons of wool. Yes, yeah. and I suppose you sell it. We sell wool, yes. <laughs> and duct tape. <laughs> 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 that's home hardware. We also have loans, you know, 